I write books about burning books so that people won't burn books. <laughs> it's that simple. I write stories about people destroying themselves so that people won't destroy themselves. I write stories about people being prejudiced so that people will not be prejudiced. It's always the reverse. Uh, any negative story that I do has a positive off-print. What you take away from it should be the positive that is uh, printed from the negative. So uh, I'm not predicting these futures. I'm writing the stories so those futures won't happen. I'm trying to shape the future by being critical of it. I'm trying to be as honest about our violence as I can be so that the violence won't occur. Telescope. Tonight, brought to you by... Your telephone company, part of the Trans-Canada Telephone System, a world of communications progress at your fingertips. Mr. Ray Bradbury, the man who just described the nature of his writing, has been described by others as a space-age moralist and as the Louis Armstrong of science fiction. But neither of these labels provide an accurate clue to the contents of books like The Martian Chronicles and Fahrenheit 451, which have sold millions of copies. Nobody writes like Ray Bradbury, and the author of more than a dozen books and almost 300 short stories is truly one of a kind. Telescope found him at his home in a suburb of Los Angeles, where he writes every day, averaging a new story or article in print each month for the past quarter century. We also accompanied him on a trip to Disneyland with two of his four daughters and to a movie studio where Rod Steiger was being made up for his starring role as the Illustrated Man, the latest Bradbury book to become a motion picture. The best representation of the writing wizard from Waukegan, Illinois, whose work combines nightmare and nostalgia, fantasy and fable, blending together into science fiction that is also social fiction, is the man himself, a man with a great gift of enthusiasm as you'll presently see and hear. Tonight's self-portrait by Ray Bradbury is not unlike the plot of his new movie. The illustrated man, as portrayed by Rod Steiger, is an attempt to uh, tell the story of a man who is trapped in his own skin with all these fabulous stories stitched onto it by a strange witch who is telling the future with a tattoo needle. In just a few moments, director Perry Rosemond and Telescope's color cameras take you to California by means of a device you are now watching that was considered science fictional only three decades ago. After this message, the illustrated Bradbury. One of the things, a lot of people think that I write science fiction to predict the future, and of course the reverse is true. I've never, many science fiction writers do do this sort of thing. They are delighted with the challenge of trying to outguess the machines and man and nature and what have you. But that's never been my function. I'm a writer of cautionary tales and moral fables in a way. I'm interested in what man is doing to himself with his machines. And in a way, I, I run ahead to the edge of the cliff and say, not this way, but that. Build a highway along the edge of the cliff by all means, but don't go off. So my stories are strongly moral in a way and uh, exemplary. And I'm not interested in predicting futures. The illustrated man was a long time arriving, but he finally got here out of a good many years of uh, my being in love with carnivals when I was growing up, being interested in painting and drawing, sketching myself, being interested in my own past and in the future. It finally had to be that I came up with an idea out of all of the carnival tattooed men that I knew when I was 12 or 13 years old. Uh, the, uh, when I helped put up the tent, that I thought of a man with stories tattooed on his body so that each one of the tattoos represents a possible happening in the man's immediate future. And I suppose the basic idea of the illustrated man, in a way, is one that we're all rather familiar with or guess about ourselves, is that we all carry within us the, uh, not only our past, but are the seeds of our possible destruction. In other words, we can't escape what we've been because what we have been makes us what we are in this moment. 
And what we are in this moment makes tomorrow inevitable unless we do something about it immediately. So the fun comes in seeing how each illustration comes to life. And there's a large open area on the back where another possible future is coming to birth. And this is left as a mystery for us to wonder about until the very end of the film, when it too begins to fill in with a pattern. Literature can only work when it is the metaphor, because if we don't want to know what we already know. We want to know more than that. So it works on two levels. If I know something you don't know, let's say that you're ignorant about something and I want to teach you, I must instruct you so cleverly that you I get you to thinking you already knew it. Then you'll accept my knowledge. Then if I'm going to tell you something you already know, I've got to be twice as clever because then I have to clothe it in such metaphors that it seems totally new. So a science fiction story then must be one that very subtly suggests the present by occurring in the future. The difference between Ray Bradbury writing science fiction writing and the whole rest of the field is that Bradbury finds and isolates the human problem as he might expect it to be in the future culture, the future society, the technological age. And if you're interested in the people, interested in what can happen to them, interested in what can happen to the society that makes people certain ways, uh, then I think the Bradbury prognostication of the future is really dealing with the human predicament, not just with the technological advance, with the effects of that on the social order. I think the greatest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world is the invention of the motion picture camera and projector. I think more good has come into the world because of the fact that with a bit of film and with these science fictional machines, we are able to be black when we're white to be female when we're male, male when we're female, to become a Catholic for two hours when we're a Jew, to be a Jew for a few hours when uh, we're a Muslim, and discover suddenly that across that wall of flesh and sex and religion and politics are human beings. When you see a film like War and Peace, the Russian version which has just been made, six hours long, and when you come out the other end, you're in tears, and you suddenly say, my God, why didn't I think? Why haven't I thought more often? The Russians are people. They're not symbols. They're not automatically an enemy with a capital E, just as we on this side <laughs> are not the enemy with a capital E. We are two groups of people on a miraculous world who know nothing of how we got here, who know nothing of where we're going, so shouldn't we fuse somewhere along the line? Forget the labels. We must, because there's only one race, essentially, in this world, one race of people, three billion strong. And these, these petty wars, these petty labelings, these things whereby we scarify our own flesh are ridiculous. So the motion picture device is, is a machine that I admire and want to work with so that I can teach more people how to be black and yellow and red and white and human because humanity is not a shape or a color or a size it's an essence these are the uh, tracings of the illustrations that we put on Rod Steiger the process took about nine hours each time it was a very complicated process and we had to put Mr. Steiger under sedation a few times with eight people painting on him, you can imagine what that was like. I think one of the amusing things that happened at the start of production of the Illustrated Man was the first day I arrived in the makeup room, saw Rod Steiger laid out there with all these makeup men working on his body, putting on the illustrations. And when he saw me come in, he lifted his head and scowled at me and said, next time I'm going to stick with Ernest Hemingway. No matter what your profession in this world, uh, you're grabbing onto a piece of reality, interpreting it, and uh, helping yourself and others to make do, but in the best sense of the word make do. In other words, uh, we are the tension-collecting animals of this world. We are that particular creature in the world who decides to put away violence most of the time. So we put away the fact of violence, um, many kinds of facts that we would act out 
in the natural world beyond the city. And in order to inhabit cities, we put away actions. We save things. We are the only creature in the world that does this. Uh, every other animal acts in the instant to destroy or run from destruction. Uh, we choose not to do so. We build walls. We build cities. And so inside these cities, inside these walls, we need artists. We need people like myself who take hold of a piece of reality and say, this is what it is. Uh, we've saved up attention for tears. So I, as a writer, come along and try to help you to cry at the right time. We save up attention of laughter, perhaps for our silly politicians. I come along as a writer and help you to laugh. Uh, we save up tensions of murdering. Uh, the uh, wonderful fact about civilization is that most people do not murder, uh, that most of us are peace-loving, that we do make do in the best sense. So I come along with a story and enable you for an hour to murder so that the next day you don't have to do it in reality. Uh, and Nietzsche puts it beautifully. We have art that we do not uh, uh, die of reality. Reality is too much with us. Uh, I think we know all of the basic facts of life, each of us. Uh, we know too much about death. We know too much about age. We know too much about love that, that sometimes fails us. Uh, people do go away. People do vanish. Uh, friends uh, go off over the world and never come back. Our children finally go out into the world on their own. Uh, all of us finally uh, leave the fact of existence. Now, these build all kinds of tensions for us. So what I try to do is go to my typewriter and many days experiment with words to find out what my tension is. Do I need to laugh or cry on a particular day? I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. So I begin to type any word that comes into my mind, the dwarf, the night, the lake, the wind, uh, a time machine, and then say to myself, why have you put that word down there? Uh, why have you written the nursery, for instance, on the typewriter? What kind of nursery? Where? A nursery in the past? No. The present? No. What about the future? What would a nursery be like in the future? Well, it would be automated. It would uh, provide you with an environment, let's say, so that you could go into that nursery and command it to take you to South America or Africa or the North Pole, and suddenly you're surrounded by the three dimensions and color of that environment. All right, put your children in such an environment. Uh, show that environment to the parents. What does this do to the family relationship? And suddenly you're off and flying, all because you dared to put on paper the words, the nursery. You didn't even know the story was in you, but you go with it. After a brief intermission, Telescope returns to its self-portrait by Ray Bradbury. Mr. Bradbury, by the way, will be a continuing contributor to our forthcoming cycle of programs about the world of tomorrow, adding his voice to Telescope's footnotes on the future. I have a long memory going back to when I was born. You know, a lot of people question me about this, but I do remember being born, and I remember a heck of a lot of incidents from the time of my birth on up through the time I was three. I suppose this has been very helpful to me in my later career and my ability to recollect sensually things in my past life so that when I asked myself, do you remember the day you discovered you were alive, which is a very special day in all our lives, around the time you're eight or nine years old, you suddenly stop in the middle of a very wonderful hour and perhaps feel the wind blowing on the hair on the back of your hand and listen to it whispering over your eardrums and say, for God's sake, I'm alive. I just never thought of it before. Here I am. It's wonderful. One of the truths that we discover as children is if the family is functioning in any way at all, even if we're very poor, and at one time I was, we were on relief, our family. There were four of us in our particular family. That you uh, can have happy years, and the challenge comes from sneaking into theaters where you can't afford to pay, of finding ways to have fun with whatever's given you. Well, this is the neighborhood I lived in about 25 years ago. At the end of my teen years, in the beginning of my 20s, I uh, lived in a tenement just down the street, very much like this 
Victorian tenement behind me with a lot of people whose parents had come here from Spain and Mexico and China and Japan. And when I lived in the uh, tenement, I knew many people uh, very well. I knew some people who shared clothes together. And out of knowing these people, I wrote a short story and a play called The Wonderful Ice Cream Suit, which is a story of six Mexican-American chaps who move into a tenement and share one ice cream suit together. To show you the kind of enthusiasms I've had, uh, I'm a super enthusiast. I can't do anything unless I feel I would die if I didn't do it. It's the only way to live for me, I, and I don't understand people who are not enthusiasts. But when I was 14 and first arrived in California, I headed for the studios immediately to hang around out in front of Paramount and MGM and, and look at all these heroes. And one day I saw W.C. Fields over in front of uh, Paramount Studios, and I ran over and got his autograph, and he, he signed the paper, and he handed the pen back to me. He says, there you are, you little son of a bitch. And it was a beautiful moment. I've never forgotten it. it wonderfully vulgar, but I felt as if I'd been knighted by the great man. So I've called myself Sir Ray Bradbury ever since, because I got the designation from W.C. Fields. I think I keep coming back to Disneyland because I find so much of myself here. I walk down the main street, I see a house that's very much like the house I was born in, in Waukegan, Illinois. I find my childhood here. I find a lot of the present that I'm existing in here, and especially I find a heck of a lot of the future I've been writing about for 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's a paradoxical place. It's uh, a mixture of the fact that there is uh, a lot of mystery to do with us, uh, a lot of uh, the ability to look back, but at the same time, in looking back, be able to build for the future. I imagine that my children and I will be coming back here for a good many years. Bettina is a, a super enthusiast, a great reader. I think she's going to be the closest thing to gentlemen prefer blondes. I think she's going to be our flapper. Alexandra is the one that keeps us all in line. If we get out of line, well, our 10-year-old uh, takes a chalk and dares us to come across <laughs> the mark that she makes. My oldest daughter, Susan, is studying at Oxford. And Ramona, beyond being the artist of the family, I believe, is in many ways closer to my own way of thinking about the world. She has my same tendencies to uh, cry over a lot of things, be very sentimental, and uh, I hope have true sentiment with that. My wife, Marguerite, is the real brain in the family. She's the one that catches all the errors in my manuscripts as they come up. She's the one who really taught me grammar during the last 20 years so that I can get through an entire manuscript without making a fool out of myself. I suppose if you were to describe this room and the things in it, it's a way of keeping yourself open. All kinds of books and philosophy and religion and humor and art and all kinds of artifacts, a piece of a balloon, a part of an old valentine, signs from the films I worked on here. Moby Dick was my first screenplay. A billboard from Fahrenheit 451. Masks here that I've collected. Spanish conquistadors, various tin masks. I have put away on various shelves. 30 years of Prince Valiant. That's the sort of enthusiasm I have for comic strip. I have uh, all of Buck Rogers from the year 1929 up through 37. He was one of the uh, initial prime movers in my life. Uh, I couldn't have existed without Buck Rogers. All of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan books put away. Some of my own paintings I, uh, I mess around with. Uh, not very good. This is supposed to be Mars. Not a very good one. It's one of the few that I like. A picture of the Halloween tree. And as a result of painting this huge tree full of pumpkins, I came up with a story idea, which is now being done as an animated cartoon, 
by Chuck Jones. The problem is that I always seem to run into my... my uh... The Halloween tree will set out to show us a history of Halloween. The mythology is confused. So what we've tried to do is, is research the holiday, go back to the time of the caveman, come up through Roman and Greek times to the Egyptian pharaohs, the flight of the Druids, and in turn then the movement of Halloween as a holiday, All Souls Day and what have you, across Europe to Ireland and from Ireland basically to the United States because the holiday really didn't get going here until the potato famines and when the Irish came over, with their customs and began to uh, go begging for alms. So the custom of going from door to door saying trick or treat is based on a, a very grave reality of a starving and dying people. Working with Ray is sort of like working in the washing machine of the future. He keeps you stimulated. They're kind of a, of a here-ness, a now-ness, which you're not you're really fine with writers. Writers tend to either work in the past or what they believe to be the future. But I don't think Ray's ever written anything which has anything to do with the future. I mean, he makes the future now by, by the way he writes and by his awareness of, of a sort of vitality. And it rubs off on people that work with him. That's why it's fun to work with him. In the instant of getting an idea, I go act it out on paper. I don't put it away. I don't delay. I don't put off to tomorrow doing what I must do right now to find out what my secret self needs, wants, desires with all its heart. And then it speaks, and I have enough brains to get out of the way and listen. And two hours later, sitting at the typewriter, you look at the paper and you say, Ah, so that's what I think about the death of Hemingway. Is that how much I was hurt? So that we act out these tensions continually. We keep cleansing the stream, just as any impurity running downhill in a river, by the time it travels nine miles is purified. So the life of a man traveling to the sea, which is our inevitable death someday, purifies itself. It must. Because if you do not purify, these tensions remain in and turn in on yourself and destroy you. The man who cannot laugh freely is a sick man. The man who cannot cry and release his tears in that direction is a sick man. The man who cannot be violent through exercise, through sports, through acting out his violence in paper or painting or acting on a stage is a sick man. I've made the point on many occasions that the only thing you're ever going to own in your life is your work. I own my books. The farmer who farms creatively and happily is a man that knows every stalk of wheat or corn that comes up uh, on his land because he has tilled these fields, because he has planted the seed, because he has picked the fruit, because he has painted the barn. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, does it? But when you actually paint a house, I painted a house, a whole house once. I'd never done anything like it. It was hellish work. I, I hated every moment. But when I was over and stood back, it looked beautiful, and I was rather proud of myself. The house belonged to me suddenly. So we belong only by doing, and we own only by doing, and we love only by doing and knowing. And if you want an interpretation of life and love, that would be the closest thing I could come to.